This is the FRAP video, and you should check out the syllabus for corresponding readings in the textbook. So I want to start out talking about fluorescence. And one thing that's important to know right off the bat is that it's super cool, has a lot of applications, and secondly, that its spelling is different than that of flower, so watch out for that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about fluorescence. So basically, fluorescence is the emission of light from a molecule. And there are a lot of different molecules that can emit light. Some of them are natural molecules um, and are bioluminescent, for example, from a, uh, a firefly um, or a jellyfish, and other ones are produced in a laboratory. The molecules that are fluorescing are known as fluorophores, and a fluorofluor is a fluorescent chemical compound that can re-emit light upon excitation from an external light source. And for our purposes, that would be, for example, a UV lamp or a laser beam. I don't get to say laser beam very often in my lectures, so that's kind of fun. Um, the, la the laser beam can uh, be kind of modified to different wavelengths, and this can correspond to particular uh, different fluorophores. So each fluorophore would have a particular uh, light wavelength at which it would uh, be excited, and then it could, re it could emit light. Okay, so let's talk about some of the applications of fluorescence, especially for science. So a lot of those are shown here on this slide, and I have to say there are, are a lot of amazing fluorescent um, images out there. If you get bored, it'd be a, a fun way to kind of check out a lot of different options. These are just a few options um, for how people have used fluorescence. And basically, um, here are some of those applications. Basically, you can label live cells and watch the movement of certain molecules. And there's two examples of that here, um, at least of cells that are labeled. So one of them, um, right here on the lower left, this is looking at individual cells here. The nucleus um, is along here, and you might be able to guess what these long fibers are. Um, they're part of the cytoskeleton, presumably they're tubulin, and basically here we see that there's um, fluorescence that labels just uh, that particular protein tubulin, and it makes some really amazing arrays. Uh, secondly, over here, this is a HeLa cell, and it's labeled with two different fluorescent molecules. Each of them emits a different color, so um, one protein is uh, emitting a red fluorescence, and another one is emitting a green fluorescence. And in this case, the uh, green is labeling uh, some mitochondrial proteins, and then uh, the red is labeling um, another fibrous protein. A second application for, um, for using fluorescence is uh, to be able to look at specific gene expression um, in different structures of a more complex organism, like a multicellular organism. And certainly you could do that for an uh, individual cell too, but an example over here on the right is a fruit fly, which is labeled with a green fluorescent protein. And as you can see, it's outlining certain portions of the wing, um, certain cells there, as well as certain cells along uh, these striped patterns along the abdomen. And also it is labeling the eye. So it's not just that the that particular 
um, fluorescence, there's a dye that just sticks to those areas. There's a particular protein that is expressed in that pattern, which is tagged with the fluorescence. And um, the next one I'll talk about is that we can use this in genetics. Scientists can use fluorescence in genetics, for example, to distinguish litter mates. Um, for example, the homozygotes um, like the homozygous recessive uh, versus heterozygous individuals. And um, those might be mutant versus wild type, for example. And so basically here you can see that there are several different mouse litter mates. Some of them are expressing the green fluorescent pr protein here, um, and some of them are not. And so for a particular scientist, they might be interested only in one or the other. At any rate, they can easily um, sort them just by using a UV lamp, it will excite uh, the green fluorescent protein um, and then cause them to um, display this, this difference. And finally, fluorescence has been recruited kind of um, for fun, maybe, um, or at least for marketing. So there are glowing cats that are um, have been produced. So you can see here, this is a green fluorescence and a red fluorescence in this cat. There's also glowing fish, um, glowing pigs, I don't know if there's glowing llamas, but maybe. The next thing I want to talk about is where the fluorescent molecules come from. So there are a lot of different fluorescent molecules out there. Um, and again, uh, we can see a whole spectrum of uh, the rainbow, basically, with these fluorescent molecules. And some of these are made uh, naturally, as mentioned before. Others are produced in a laboratory. Um, one of the um, key proteins, which I want you guys to know about, that's incredibly useful for cellular biology um, and a lot of um, other fields of biology is uh, shown here, and it's the green fluorescent protein. So that's its name, and it is its abbreviation is GFP, which you should know. GFP is to about 238 amino acids. There are a variety of different variations out there. And um, in the um, picture here, you can see the jellyfish, um, Oria victoria, in which GFP was originally isolated. And then um, you can see that particular regions of the jellyfish express the GFP. Uh, just kind of FYI, these jellyfish are commonly found in the Pacific Ocean, ranging all the way from Alaska to Central California. They're particularly plentiful in Puget Sound, which is in Washington. And kind of a fun fact, so in 2008, a uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded for the scientists who um, isolated green fluorescent protein and, um, and learned about it. This is the uh, protein structure of green, green fluorescent protein, so you might recognize this shape, so think about what that could be. If you're thinking of a beta barrel, that's correct. Uh, the fluorophore portion is in the middle here, just kind of FYI. And there are a lot of variations of green fluorescent protein. Now there are red fluorescent, yellow fluorescent, and so those are called um, RFP or YFP. And you may run across those in some of the technique articles that we talk about when we look at data, um, or in your textbook when they have certain images. So next let's talk about how uh, the protein that we might be interested in would end up with fluorescence. That's through a process called tagging. Um, so there's two ways to tag proteins. Uh, one way is to covalently bond a fluorescent molecule to your molecule of interest. And so an example is over here. Uh, so there are several commercially available uh, fluorescent molecules. They both, um, at least the ones that are shown here, end with dope, it's kind of funny. Um, and so basically these are obviously very complex chemical structures. And so these can be purchased and then covalently bonded to whatever you're interested in, if it's a protein, or a lipid, or a phospholipid, etc. Secondly, you can create a fusion protein 
um, using genetic engineering. And you could maybe try that at home, but obviously requires quite a bit of um, steps. And uh, basically in this, in a really simple form, I'll just uh, kind of tell you the deal. So we insert DNA encoding a fluorescent molecule in frame with your gene of interest. And so basically, let's say this is the coding for um, GFP, so this is all DNA. And you want to tag tubulin protein um, eventually with a GFP protein. So at the DNA level, you bring in the GFP DNA that encodes uh, GFP, and then you insert it with uh, the tubulin gene. And then basically, when this is translated in the cell, um, the cell basically makes the GFP protein and then uh, makes the tubulin protein and they're attached to each other. So that's what this is showing over here. Uh, so GFP uh, is here. They have a little linker so there could be some extra stuff in here that I'm glossing over. And then this is the tubulin uh, which is uh, normally present in the cell and so basically you've tagged your, um, your protein, this tubulin protein with GFP. And so then that could look something like this. Um, in the cell, um, in each of the cells then, here um, would be the tubulin protein with GFP attached to it, and, uh, um, and so then you could track the tubulin proteins by using a UV light and then recording um, the fluorescence that's emitted. And just to kind of sum this up, so this whole thing here, this is, um, would be able to create a fusion protein when this gene, um, when this DNA, these two genes that have been merged together are transcribed and translated. And if it seems a little bit odd to you to stick two proteins uh, attached to each other that normally would not be attached to each other, and think that they're going to work the same way. That's a, a really good thought. There's a lot of controls that have to come in to make sure that this alpha tubulin is still doing all the normal things that it would do, and that this extra uh, tack on of GFP isn't somehow uh, changing its function. Okay, so now that we've talked about fluorescence, I want to talk about the photo bleaching, which is one part of the um, FRAP. Um, so let's talk about photo bleaching first. So photo bleaching. is shown in this cell and basically this is a photochemical alteration of a dye or fluoro fluorophore molecule such that it permanently is unable to fluoresce. So basically in this picture we're looking at a cell. They've color coded the cell green here, um, but the idea is that uh, a laser beam um, has been aimed at this little area which is shown in the dashed area. And so if that laser beam is left on there too long, um, and this would have to be like on the order of like 10 minutes or something rather than a typical, let's say, minute, um, or less. Uh, so this particular region, uh, the fluorescence, is um, no longer able to emit light. And so you just see a black area there instead of um, the fluorescence. Um, and so that's, this is the photo bleaching event here. And then basically the cells, um, if they're alive, can recover. So cells uh, can recover uh, from the photo bleaching. And that's basically what we rely on for the FRAP method. Not FRAP A. I had to put it in there. Um, and we'll talk some more about that on the next slide. Okay, so now what we're doing is zooming in to look at that area that 
a very small area of the cell and checking out um, what the membrane looks like from the side view and also looking at the top view, uh, kind of zoomed out a bit to see what this um, would look like if, um, if photobleaching might take place um, or if fluorescence is happening as we'd expect. Um, so basically here we're uh, looking at a cell that is uh, fluorescing this red color and on the side here we see all the individual um, phospholipids that they're showing and this is saying that all these phospholipids here are emitting that fluorescence. And then here, this is uh, the laser that is bleaching this particular area. Bleaching them basically kills the fluorescence. Um, and so the phospholipids that are right here in the bleached area, those are all going to be um, turned this black color. And so that would look like this, um, this dark uh, kind of hole. Um, if given enough, enough time, then notice that these phospholipids can still move around. And do you remember what that's called when the phospholipids move uh, back and forth across the... Um, one particular layer in the phospholipid bilayer, um, so that's lateral diffusion. So those phospholipids can start to spread out, and notice that now this uh, dark spot is not as um, crisp, and so basically it's starting to fill in or recover here. Um, and then down at the bottom here, we can see that this is a recovery to the point that you don't see a hole anymore in that uh, fluorescent area, but do you notice that the red color is a little more dim? So basically this is saying that these uh, black uh, phospholipids, which can no longer fluoresce, have spread themselves out evenly across um, each of the layers of the phospholipid bilayer, and so now we see just a little less bright. That may or may not be apparent. Um, it depends on how big of an area that we're, we're considering. So let's talk a little more about that technique. Um, so again, it's called FRAP fluorescence, recovery, after photo bleaching, and the deal is that this is a technique to be able to look at membrane fluidity. Uh, so basically you can, can compare membrane fluidity across different treatments or cell types. Um, Etc. You could probably compare different proteins um, as well. So again, this is the photo bleach event here. This is the recovery, especially at the end here. So kind of in the process of recovering. And so basically what can be done for this is that a graph can be prepared. And so you can measure the amount of fluorescence, kind of the intensity on the left, um, and then time on the right. And basically we're going to start off with fluorescence um, at a really high amount. So that corresponds to uh, panel A up here. And then when this photo bleaching event occurs, then there's going to be a, a rapid drop. Basically, those uh, fluorescent molecules just all of a sudden can't do it anymore. And then the recovery is going to look something like this. To compare the fluorescence recovery, you can basically compare the slope. Um, and also, um, scientists will uh, measure the diffusion coefficient um, and calculate that using the graph. We're not going to talk about how to calculate that, but I want you to know about the diffusion coefficient. Namely, that greater values for the diffusion coefficient mean a faster recovery uh, for fluorescence rec recovery. One last thing, make sure that you check out Movie 11.6, which is on the textbook website, and you can find that link through Moodle. It's got a really nice uh, depiction of this process. Next thing I want to talk about is single particle tracking, and we can see some of the results of single particle tracking here. So single particle tracking, or SPT, is a method 
in which individual molecules, for example, proteins, are labeled um, with a tag. Um, it is often a colloidal gold, uh, which is de detected by an antibody. And um, for now, just know that we are looking at individual proteins or a very small number of proteins. This is in contrast to the FRAP, where we're looking at um, a, a region of the cell which um, a large swath of uh, proteins or other uh, fluorescent molecules are bleached. So single particle tracking um, can show us uh, more individualized movement. And basically this um, is going to track movement, um, in other words, diffusion of a molecule. And so we basically see a trace of where a particular molecule has uh, been going. And so you can see that there's a range of these uh, kind of drawings. So in A, uh, this is one SPT re uh, T result, where this particular protein, let's say, started right here and then moved all around over this period of time. Um, on the other hand, for uh, protein C, notice that it didn't move very much at all. And so basically the more spread out that the SPT is, then uh, the more that particular protein diffuses. And so one thing to think about is under what circumstances one protein might be able to diffuse more than another, for example, due to its localization or membrane properties.